Thank you so much, Tom, for that introduction. I'm recalling that the first Beecher lectures I ever read uh, and didn't attend at the time to the fact that they were the Beecher lectures were Frederick Beekner's Telling the Truth, the Gospel uh, as Comedy, Tragedy, and Fairy Tale. And I reread that and several other of the Beecher lectures uh, in preparing for this and noted the first paragraph in Frederick Beekner's book is about Henry Ward Beecher preparing his lectures and the panic that he had, that he had, he was, as I recall it, sick to his stomach and in his hotel room on the flight here, and he still didn't have a word that he was going to speak. I found it a great source of consolation, <laughs> I have to say. I literally typed up the paragraph and posted it by my computer and said, if this happened to Henry Ward Beecher, there's, there's hope. So thank you so much. I'd like to begin with um, an insight from uh, Gerhard Abling, who reminded us that theology is necessary in order to make preaching as difficult as it needs to be. And that is nowhere more true than when we're talking about the promise of resurrection and in any sense speaking of wisdom to be found in the cross or in the experience of human suffering. I'd also like to begin with this passage from uh, the letter to the Colossians. <clears throat> I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to the saints. How are we to preach or hear that passage from the letter to the Colossians, proclaimed regularly in the context of worship as good news? Is it telling us that suffering is part of the mystery of God's hidden plan that will be revealed only at the end of time? Is it saying that we should in fact rejoice in our sufferings since they are a participation in the sufferings of Christ, even somehow making up something that was lacking in Christ's own sacrifice on the cross? Although the reading can initially sound as if that is the hard truth of God's word that we need to accept, that's exactly why preachers and all of us are called to wrestle with this word of God along with all difficult passages from scripture. Our challenge is not to water them down to say only what we want to hear, but rather to make sure that the God we preach is the God of Jesus and that the wisdom of the cross is not separated from the wisdom of Jesus' life and ministry and God's final word of the wisdom of resurrection. I picked this passage because several years ago I was scheduled to speak midweek on the wisdom of the cross in a parish in upper New York State. It just so happened I met uh, Yale uh, graduate who's here uh, for your convocation, who is from that, uh, from that location, in Rochester, New York. Uh, this passage from Colossians that I read was the lectionary reading for the Eucharist for the following Sunday, and so we were using it for the focus for the preaching workshop we were doing. The passage is a difficult one to grapple with at any time. But in addition, I found out two days before I went to do this preaching workshop, along with a lecture on the mystery of the cross, I found out that this community was still reeling from the recent deaths of five young women, all recent high school graduates, uh, most of them, as I recall, cheerleaders, whose lives had been cut short in a tragic automobile accident only weeks earlier, between their graduation and mid-July. And one of them, the driver they discovered later, had been texting. It was one of those tragic events as well. 
Undoubtedly, there were many worshipers that weekend in that location who found it difficult to hear the words attributed to the Apostle Paul, I am now rejoicing in my sufferings. We all struggle with what to say in these situations of shock and grief and how to support those who survive and mourn. None of us know the words to speak. And there are times when the scriptures say even the Holy Spirit does not have words, but prays within us with sighs too deep for words. Or in another translation, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in speech. The well-known pastor, preacher, and social activist William Sloan Coffin, Jr., who, as you know, was a Yale graduate and former chaplain here for almost 20 years and who delivered the Beecher Lectures himself soon after he left that post, Coffin was faced with the same situation in his own family. He offers some of the best advice for preachers in reminding us what not to say. Pastor of Riverside Church in New York City until his own death in 2006, Coffin was known for his prophetic preaching about the cost of discipleship, particularly for his emphasis on the social and political implications of the gospel in a society obsessed with consumerism and marked by competition, war, violence. He regularly called his congregation to reflect on the pain of the world and the response that's needed by the Christian community. But that pain touched his own life in an unexpected and tragic way when his 24-year-old son, Alexander, died in a car accident in Boston Harbor. Coffin spoke of that pain in a poignant sermon he preached 10 days later. The power of his words and the challenge they offer to those who speak too quickly of the mystery of human suffering as God's will his words bear repeating. Here is part of his sermon that day. When a person dies, there are many things that can be said, and there is at least one thing that should never be said. The night after Alex died, I was sitting in the living room of my sister's house outside of Boston when the front door opened and in came a nice-looking middle-aged woman carrying about 18 quiches. When she saw me, she shook her head, then headed for the kitchen, saying sadly over her shoulder, I just don't understand the will of God. Instantly, I was up and in hot pursuit, swarming all over her. I'll say you don't, lady, I said. <laughs> I knew the anger would do me good, and the instruction to her was long overdue. I continued. <laughs> Do you think it was the will of God that Alex never fixed those lousy windshield wipers of his? That he was probably driving too fast in such a storm? That he probably had a couple of frosties too many? Do you think it is God's will that there are no street lights along that stretch of road? No guardrails separating the road and Boston Harbor? For some reason, Nothing so infuriates me as the in incapacity of seemingly intelligent people to get it through their heads that God doesn't go around this world with his finger on triggers, his fist around knives, his hands on steering wheels. God is dead set against all unnatural deaths. And Christ spent an inordinate amount of time delivering people from paralysis, insanity, leprosy, muteness. The one thing that should never be said when someone dies is, it is the will of God. Never do we know enough to say that. My own consolation lies in knowing it was not the will of God that Alex die that when the waves closed over the sinking car, God's heart was the first of all of ours to break. The sermon is longer and equally powerful, but 
I stop there with Coffin's words. Even in his personal anguish, and without diminishing his conviction that God's heart encompasses the pain of the world, Coffin was able to identify human factors that likely contributed to his son's death, including windshield wipers in need of repair, the lack of needed road barriers, errors of human judgment. He acknowledged that there are additional forms of grief and confusion that accompany nature-caused deaths. Uh, and he went on to say, I can think of many right here in the parish in the last five years, deaths that are untimely, slow, and pain-ridden, and for that reason raise unanswerable questions and even the specter of a cosmic sadist. Again, his words, Coffins. This pastor and grieving father was able to remind his congregation that different kinds of death and violence present different challenges to faith, and that faith is always radical trust in spite of doubt. But our so-called secular society and some preachers are not so careful. They not only attribute cosmic events to God's explicit intentions, but also interpret the divine will in a grand scheme of reward and punishment. Insurance companies and legal suits refer to so-called natural disasters, droughts, avalanches, hurricanes, earthquakes, as acts of God. Even more troubling are the judgments of preachers, often widely broadcast on the media. When the devastation of AIDS was thought to affect primarily homosexual persons and intravenous drug users, some proclaimed that that scourge was God's judgment on immoral behavior. All too often, the very people most affected by the world's tragedies internalize those questionable theological judgments. Just after a cyclone in Bangladesh, for example, a number of years ago, I can still see the picture of this woman's face on the front page of the USA Today, and the caption below, why is God punishing us? The challenge to preachers who would announce God's saving presence in a world of suffering is intensified by our dawning awareness of the complexity of the universe and conflicting predictions about its future. Many believers, religious leaders, even professional scientists, see no contradiction between an evolutionary account of the universe story and belief in a creator God whose love poured out into the abyss, brought life into being, and continues to sustain it, and continues to sustain its possibilities for novelty. So some see no problem with that. But others, scientists and philosophers, I again saw one yesterday or this weekend in the USA Today, challenge that interpretation, emphasize the randomness of mutation, the disorder of entropy, the possibility that the whole process has occurred as a great cosmic accident without purpose and without future. In a cover story in Time magazine, journalist Michael Lamonic predicted that in light of discoveries in astrophysics, T.S. Eliot's words might offer the most likely description of the end time that the cosmos and humankind faces. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Citing University of Michigan astrophysicist Fred Adams' prediction that all the matter in the universe will eventually collapse into those black holes, the journalist estimated, by the time the universe is one trillion, 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 trillion years old, the black holes themselves will disintegrate into stray particles, which will bind loosely to form individual atoms larger than the size of today's universe. Eventually, even these will decay, leaving a featureless, infinitely large void. And that will be that. Unless, of course, whatever inconceivable event that launched the original Big Bang should recur, and the ultimate free lunch is served once more. <laughs> That's the journalist. In, right? <laughs> 
Good line for preachers, huh? <laughs> this provides yet another challenge to Christian faith and specifically to the proclamation of Christian hope in resurrection as well as the wisdom of the cross. Did we evolve from a purposeless universe in which violence is the natural way of the world and only the most powerful will survive? As Christian believers, how can we proclaim that the life and death of one first century man profoundly affected evolutionary history? This lecture cannot provide simple answers to those difficult questions, and I don't propose to. But as we begin, it's essential that, faith, that we recall faith is always a wager. And for Christians, that wager is rooted in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which is the beginning of all Christian testimony and is the story on which we stake our lives. After reflecting on that briefly, I think it's equally important to remember that the commitment to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, even unto death, does not resolve how we are to interpret the cross theologically, or whether Christians necessarily believe that it was God's will for Jesus or for us suffering. There have been diverse perspectives on that question in the tradition, including in the scriptures, from the beginning and the question continues to be hotly debated today. So after reviewing some key perspectives in that debate, I'll turn to one contemporary reading of the story of Jesus as revealing God's will, the view of Edward Skillabakes, who suggests that in one sense, we are saved despite the cross. That perspective can help preachers reflect on what not to say about human suffering. And finally then, I want to return to the pastoral dilemma that, fe that faces each of us and listen to some of the voices of experience that testify that in spite of its negative dimension, there is a dark mystery that at times can be found in the experience of suffering. The power of hope and courage in the face of the powers of evil and destruction is a power that Christians find confirmed and promised in the resurrection of Jesus. It is a power that the, only the Spirit of God can make available, and the Spirit promises to do so not only for the baptized, but also beyond the Christian community in the lives of those the Christian liturgy describe when, describes when it refers to as those whose faith is known to God alone. The question of whether and how God is related to human suffering is at the heart of theology today because the extent of innocent suffering is a primary cause of atheism and because God's name is invoked as the ultimate justification for horrific forms of human violence. For Christians believers, the questions of belief in an all-powerful and good God in the face of evil and suffering and how to interpret the cross and, and the basis for resurrection hope, all of those questions are intimately intertwined. Christian belief in the creator God as source of life and final hope for the universe is not an abstract philosophical or scientific deduction about the plausibility of believing that there's meaning and purpose in the universe. Rather, creation faith, Christian creation faith, is rooted in and shaped by the story of Jesus the one Christians believe has disclosed God's plan for human history in the flesh. But does the fact that, as St. Paul said, we preach Christ and him crucified mean that suffering was clearly part of the creator God's mysterious plan from the beginning? So I'd like to focus very specifically on that first. As persons of all religious traditions were painfully reminded on September 11th and its af aftermath, how we interpret our traditions, what we say and do in the name of God, and how we understand the will of God 
can have an enormous impact on the human community, our world, and to some extent, even the universe. In a time of increasing violence perpetuated in the, perpetrated in the name of God, Christians are called to reflect on the impact of our theologies of the cross and how we speak of God and God's will in the face of both human suffering and cosmic tragedy. After the terrorist attacks on September 11th, some Christian leaders were quoted as saying, somehow this was the mystery of God's plan that we just can't understand. Other Christian leaders went even further and claimed that 9-11 was God's judgment on a nation that had lost faith, and even more specifically, on feminists, gays and lesbians, abortionists, and civil liber libertarians. Two years later, when the shuttle Columbia exploded within minutes of landing, anti-American voices were heard to say, this was God's judgment on the United States for its unjust war, our unjust war on Iraq. The connection between religious worldviews and violence is painfully evident as we witness genocide, suicide bombers, ethnic cleansing, and systematic dehumanization of the other in the name of God and God's will. There were, of course, other religious leaders who would not identify evil human actions or destruction as God's will, but who nevertheless continue to struggle to see those events as somehow in the mystery of God's plan. Some follow the reasoning uh, that led Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, to distinguish between what God directly wills and what God permits. To speak of God as the source of all that exists and, uh, and of any power to act, they insist, requires the conclusion that God at least permits all that happens, both in natural processes and in human decisions. My colleague, Christopher Kiesling, a Dominican priest with whom I taught at Aquinas my early years there, uh, was basically dying of cancer during those years and was a great theological colleague and mentor. And he explained this view uh, of God's permissive will and how it differs uh, from God's direct or active uh, willing. And the, he, what he tried to focus on in a very powerful article, I always call it the vocation of the cancer patient, and that was not the name of it, but he actually uses that language at the end of the article. Uh, but he refers, referred to what Thomas really mean by God's permissive will and what he himself believed as he was dying of cancer. And he wrote this, God does not directly will or desire or cause evil. In fact, evil is more repugnant to God than it is to us. God abhors it more intensely than we do. But God does permit it to occur. God allows it to happen for good purposes which God knows but which remain mysterious to us. To deny that God allows evil in this way is to deny that God is God. God's permissive will does not explain anything. It simply affirms that evil is not beyond the reach of God's knowledge or power or mercy. Given Aquinas' commitment to search for the intelligibility of faith in reflecting on God and all of reality in relation to God, the distinction between what God actively wills and what God permits was an important one. Kiesling understood that, and he understood it in his own suffering, and he incorporated it into his own spirituality as well as his theological framework. But if theology is not only to be systematically coherent, which of course was a great concern of Thomas Aquinas and of Chris, but also pastorally accountable in our day, the precision of that distinction between what God wills and what God permits does not convey for many people the conviction that God is over against all evil and its consequences and that there is no experience of evil that is beyond the power of God.
in considering different explanations of theologies of suffering, of God's will, of theologies of the cross, I come back to the criterion that Sally McFaig once cited during a session of the American Academy of Religion when one of her books was being discussed at one of those wonderful panels there. She was still at Vanderbilt at the time, and she was responding to one of her interlocutors, and she said, well, here in the South, one criterion of good theology is, will it preach? <laughs> the concrete realities of suffering around the world provide the test cases as we consider the consequences of some of our theologies for Christian preaching. Can Christians speak of God permitting the genocide in Darfur, the systematic use of rape as a weapon of war in multiple conflicts around the globe, the starvation of untold numbers of children and the poor around the world daily, the pandemic AIDS crisis and the devastation it has brought to the whole continent of Africa. Catholic theologian Avery Dulles, with whom I studied and for whom I have, have great admiration, wrestled with this very question of God's will in relation to the, to the suffering in the context of what has become the most fundamental symbol of radical evil in our day, the Holocaust. And he did this specifically on the annual Holocaust Day commemoration in New York at the Wall of Remembrance, uh, surrounded by seven plaques of scenes from Nazi concentration camps. And in that context, Dulles concluded Nevertheless, Christians must somehow see even the Holocaust as taken up into God's redemptive plan. He recognized that that claim raised questions about one's understanding of God. And in his words, he said, the Holocaust appears to me as more than a merely human tragedy, more than a criminal act of genocide, though it is certainly both. It is a mystery. It challenges me, as I'm sure it challenges all of you, to ask how God could allow this terrible disaster to befall his own chosen and elect people. Yet, in Dulles' view, the Holocaust presents religious leaders with two alternative answers to that question. First, he said, some Jews and some Christians, unable to answer this question, have responded that the biblical God, almighty and all just, could not have permitted any such thing. They have made the Shoah the occasion for loss of faith. Second alternative, Dulles says, and he says, the alternative as I see it, is to say that the Holocaust, horrible as it seems, is somehow taken up into God's redemptive plan. Earlier, the Swiss theologian Emil Brunner from the Reformed tradition had reached a similar conclusion in his Theology of the Cross, arguing that in the presence of the cross, suffering loses its negative character and becomes a form of discipline by which God educates humankind. Brunner's words, in the presence of the cross, we cease to talk about unjust suffering. On the contrary, as we look at the crucified, all suffering gains a positive significance. To those who love God, all things work together unto good. We know this as those who have perceived the sufferings of Christ were for the good of the world. For us, suffering loses its negative character. It becomes fruitful as God's means of discipline, by means of which in paternal severity he draws us to himself. This is the greatest transformation possible in the sphere of human experience." That's Brunner. But are those options proposed by Dulles and Brunner the only alternatives? Christian faith does cling to the radical hope that no situation is beyond God's power to overcome evil with good. We believe that the victims of the Holocaust, victims of personal tragedy and natural disasters do fall into the hands of the living God. But does that necessarily mean that those events themselves are part of God's redemptive plan 
or somehow taken into the mystery of God, much less that all suffering is a means of God's discipline by which a severe father draws us to himself. However well-intentioned or theologically nuanced these claims are, they can serve not only to offer divine legitimation for the very evils they're addressing, but also to reinforce an image of God as an angry father who punishes his children out of love. In a society confronted by forms of violence that range from suicide missions by religious fanatics to child abuse in our homes and even our churches, how do we hear good news in the proclamation that God sent his beloved son to die for our sins and for our salvation? Was suffering God's will for Jesus and therefore also God's will for us? So I turn to the story of Jesus as the story of God's plan. Edward Skillabakes is among a growing number of theologians, certainly a growing number of feminist theologians as well, but I'm highlighting his work here, a growing number of theologians to answer this question of whether suffering was God's will for Jesus, whether the cross was God's will for Jesus, with a vigorous no. Although Skillabakes is firmly rooted in Thomas Aquinas' theology of creation, and clearly argues that human beings, not God, human beings are responsible for introducing moral evil into the world and for its devastating effects. Skillabakes parts ways with Aquinas on the issue of God permitting evil. As we've seen, the notion of God's permissive will was necessary for Aquinas if his other claims about God and divine causality and power were to be coherent and consistent in other words, for his theology to remain intelligible. But Skillabakes thinks Aquinas paid too high a price for systematic consistency, or at least that we would, I think would be better put, if we were to repeat his conclusions in our context. And as you may know, Skillabakes has been accused of losing the dogmatic uh, philosophical coherence he had in his earlier work when he makes this very move. Uh, he says that, in fact, given the vast amounts of suffering in human history, he felt he had to break with his Thomistic heritage on this issue of God willing the cross. When you take seriously the devastating dimensions of evil that we witness in our day, he argues, you can no longer speak of God willing suffering or in any sense permitting evil if we are to believe that God is, in fact, compassion enfleshed, Jesus as God, compassion enfleshed. Thomas could write about some suffering as having spiritual rewards or being part of God's inscrutable ways or of the virtue of the good person who is tried by suffering as reflecting the glory of God. Or he could write about, as Augustine could, evil happening for a good purpose which God knows but which remains mysterious to us. But as Skillabex notes, when we speak about suffering today, we need to realize the majority of people around the globe experience suffering in a, in a way that is radical and senseless, that dehumanizes and destroys human persons. Our words need to ring true in the face of the suffering that went on in concentration camps, the suffering that occurs when children are abused, the violence of rape, the cruelty of mass murders and tortures, the devastation of the environment. None of us can in any sense, none of this can in any sense be called God's will or legitimated in God's name. If we're to keep a pastoral and ethical concern at the forefront of our theologizing, one of the criteria of the truth of our theological claims and our preaching needs to be whether these claims move us to be active on behalf of the well-being of humankind and the earth. In other words, whether our theological claims move us to resist evil 
Skillebex is straightforward in acknowledging that Christians do not have an adequate philosophical explanation for the existence of evil or suffering. We simply cannot explain the mystery of human iniquity and the tragic dimensions of the cosmos. But faith does have a different sort of dark knowledge about the will of God, and that wisdom is gleaned from the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. God did not give us an intellectual response to evil. God gave us a human response in the person of Jesus. In his life and ministry, Jesus never appealed to evil as God's will. He did not tell people that suffering was part of God's plan for them. He recognized and called his disciples to face that suffering and death are a part of life, inevitable, especially in a world of sin, and not beyond God's saving power. In light of the resurrection, the gospel writers have portrayed Jesus as predicting his own suffering and interpreting it as a necessary dimension of proclaiming the reign of God and ushering in final salvation. The core of that insight may well go back to Jesus himself, who chose to stay the course in his preaching ministry when it was leading him toward Jerusalem, where the prophets before him met resistance and death. But in his life and ministry, Jesus was active on behalf of healing and reconciliation, of life and flourishing. Reading the icon of Jesus, it becomes clear that God's will is for humankind and creation to flourish, to be fully alive, as Irenaeus said. The God we discover in the witness of Jesus' life and ministry is a compassionate God bent toward humanity and bent toward God's beloved creation. In the words of the Gospel of John, Jesus came to bring life in all of its fullness. The image of God that Jesus enfleshed is a God of power, a God of love, who holds power over evil and who came to bring life in abundance. The wisdom of God that Jesus preached and lived was good news for the poor and the outcast, but that wisdom was not welcomed by all. Roman authorities perceived this announcement as an alternate kingdom and a new way of life and a clear challenge to their rule and the political status quo that was to their benefit. Religious leaders experienced not only a threat to their power and control, but also to their understanding of God and God's will. The suspicion, challenges, and plots to destroy Jesus that echo in the background during his ministry reach a crescendo in the Passion narratives. Betrayed by one of his beloved disciples and abandoned by most of his closest friends, Jesus, the preacher of God's unlimited compassion, was handed over to the Romans to be tortured and executed while God remained silent. How can Christians preach this scandal as saving grace? Where is the wisdom of the cross to be found in this scene of horror and darkness? Clearly not in the evil of the execution of an innocent man or the final rejection of God's wisdom enfleshed. Rather, the triumph of the cross is to be found in that kind of love offered and given in freedom, a nonviolent love that does not return evil for evil, a love that breaks the, power, the cycles of violence. Christians place our hope not in the cross, but in the power of the Spirit at work in Jesus in spite of the evil of the cross, holding open the promise of the victory of the living God. The same Spirit of love that empowered and sustained Jesus throughout his ministry enabled him to face rejection to face betrayal, to respond to hatred and violence with forgiving love. The wisdom of the cross is to be found in Christ crucified, but it is the wisdom of the one who kept faith with Abba in the darkness and embraced solidarity with humankind and all of creation to the end. 
It is the wisdom of one who laid down his life for his friends. As the Eucharistic liturgy proclaims, he stretched out his arms, joining heaven and earth in his own person. The love and forgiveness that are the gifts of God's Spirit are the power that Christians believe defeated sin and death. This is the love that triumphs over death and evil in the resurrection, which is God's definitive word. Without the resurrection, as Paul reminds us, the cross remains utter folly. The spirit who sustained Jesus in the apparent abandonment of his passion and death is also the advocate and comforter that he promised would be with his disciples in the agonies that they and we would face as well. So turn to the final question of the pastoral dilemma, where is God now? The existential question that haunts Christian believers is, how does the power of God to finally defeat and transform human suffering relate to my situation, my suffering, our suffering here and now? How are we called to participate in this Paschal mystery? As a woman diagnosed with terminal cancer said of her struggle, I don't know what to pray for, whether this cancer is God's will for me and I should be praying for the grace to surrender to my death, or whether I should be fighting it and struggling to live. I really don't know what to hope for. In their concrete experience, believers reflect diverse theologies of the cross and the God revealed there. They also share in different moments of Jesus' own paschal journey that, according to the Gospels, included both the anguished cry, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me, and the radical trust, into your hands I commend my spirit. Many who have suffered deeply are convinced that cancer or some serious illness is God's will for them and say quite clearly, I couldn't bear it if I didn't think that was true. They draw hope and strength to endure their pain from the confidence that God does not provide, that, that God does not present us with any challenge we cannot bear. But for others, the deepest level of their anguish comes from questioning why God would allow whatever's happening to happen to them or to those they love. Their struggle is made all the more painful because they often feel guilty or judged by others as, not having, ex as having not accepted God's will or not having come to terms with their illness or death. If we interpret the will of God in light of a theology of the cross, which is itself interpreted by the life and the resurrection of Jesus, there's a third possibility. Suffering is not God's will for us, nor was it God's will for Jesus. Nevertheless, when suffering befalls us in a world of finitude and sin, and in a world of human malice and cosmic forces beyond our control, when suffering befalls us, faith's reading of the mystery of the cross promises that God's spirit will be with us, offering us the courage to endure what we cannot change and holding open a future transformation that we cannot see. To embrace William Sloan Coffin's caution that we never know enough to say that specific forms of suffering are God's will and to recognize that it's, some, that it's theologically and spiritually dangerous to do so, is not to deny that there is and can be a dark and unwanted wisdom in the experience of the crucified, which countless believers have given witness to over the ages. Far from Christian masochism or romanticism or legitimation of suffering, a genuine participation in the sufferings of Christ requires radical courage and trust in the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead and who Jesus promised us would be with us as our advocate until the end of time.
There are, of course, different forms of participation in the sufferings of Christ. At times, an embrace of the cross is demanded as part of our call to conversion and to solidarity with others in a world of sin and suffering. At other times, our participation in the mystery of the cross is more a direct share in what those who have experienced it call dark wisdom, unwanted wisdom, title of Paul Crowley's book. These witnesses of faith testify from their experience that it is possible for wisdom and compassion to be born from experiences that in themselves cannot be attributed to God's will. I have uh, two sections building on these two uh, forms of participation, the one that an embrace of the cross calls us basically to participation in kenosis and in the process of conversion um, and uh, leads us to lament and grief. Um, I've developed that notion more in my book, Naming Grace, the more uh, resistance of suffering, and I'm aware of the time factor and the event to come. And in, in light of that, I'm going to skip that section and move to what I developed for these lectures, partly out of the response I've gotten over the years, particularly from people who've read that chapter on grace, uh, preaching as lament, uh, and our call to, uh, to kenosis, uh, but also our call to speak freely to God as the psalmist did in anger, in, in grief. Um, so I developed that notion more there. But every time I've done that, uh, and often people from uh, Salvador, other third world uh, countries have said to me, that's all true, all the protest, all the resistance, but in spite of that, there is still a wisdom to the cross. Could you say more about that? So I want to wrestle with that in just the few minutes that we have left here. So I'm skipping this section on kenosis and the call to conversion and solidarity. In other situations, however, so I've said above, to share in Christ's kenosis is a participation in the sufferings of Christ. I'll simply say about that also that Sean Copeland, uh, when she was still here, I believe, was one of the first to call that to my attention as so many uh, white academic feminists were racing to, to say, uh, you know, the notion of kenosis uh, is something that women cannot embrace. And Sean says, you know, I think you have to look at much more differentiated notion of women's experience and uh, that white dominant academic uh, women of privileged class, race, etc., uh, need to think seriously about our call to kenosis. Uh, so I want to give Sean credit for that as well. But the dark wisdom of the cross. In some situations, our suffering results not from the call to conversion, not from an active engagement in solidarity with those who suffer, and not from any exercise of free choice, but as a result of circumstances beyond our choice or control, whether because of the actions and choices of others, systems of injustice which, in which the exercise of power or freedom is blocked, or as a result of natural causes, we find ourselves in situations of anguish, violence, or threat, loss over which we have no control. Carmelite theologian Constance Fitzgerald has described these situations as experiences of impasse, by which she means there is no way out, no way around, no rational escape from what imprisons one, no possibilities in this situation. Whether a terminal illness as a result of natural causes, the personal violence of a brutal rape, or the systematic violence of genocide or, and war, situations of true impasse are, in the words of Alice Trillin, realizations of our worst nightmares. To speak of a wisdom that can be discovered here is dangerous. But there is another side to human experience, one sometimes expressed even by those who have suffered radical oppression or affliction, and one that needs to be honored as part of what human beings are capable of and part of what the grace of the Spirit makes possible. <clears throat> 
Christians have described this experience as a form of the wisdom of the cross, noting it's an unwanted wisdom. The testimony comes from martyrs from the time of Ignatius and Perpetua and Felicity, but also from the letters and words of contemporary martyrs such as Oscar Romero, the North American church women, the Jesuits who were murdered along with Elba and Selena Ramos, and the countless other Salvadorian, Salvadorans killed for their lives of faith. In the words of Mary Knoll's sister, Ita Ford, the challenge that we live daily is to enter into the Paschal mystery with faith. Am I willing to suffer with the people here, the suffering of the powerless? Can I say to my neighbors, I have no solution to this situation, I don't know the answers, but I will walk with you, I will search with you, I will be with you. Another Christian witness was offered by Bud Welch when his daughter Julie, Julie Marie, died in the Oklahoma bombings in April of 1995, Oklahoma City. He admitted that at first he sought vengeance against the man who drove 4,000 pounds of explosives into a government building, killing not only Welch's daughter, but hundreds of other innocent victims, including children from the daycare center housed there. Initially, Welch said, I wanted Tim McVeigh to fry. I would have killed him myself. He turned to alcohol and cigarettes to numb his pain. He was angry with God. But after several months, Welch said he recalled his daughter Julie's voice as a child telling him she thought that executions only taught children to hate. That insight led this anguished father to seek a meeting with another father in pain, Tim McVeigh's father, Bill McVeigh, an encounter which Welch said left him feeling closer to God. It was in that experience, according to Welch, that he was strengthened in his conviction that more violence would not bring Julie back and that this experience provided for him a dark wisdom about the futility of vengeance. He subsequently claimed he was proud now of the stance his church has taken against the death penalty and he's become an active spokesperson against it himself. But the testimony that wisdom can be born in undeserved suffering and unwanted pain comes not only from Christian martyrs or in Christian terminology of the cross. It's the wisdom that black lesbian poet Audre Lorde described to her professional colleagues as a result of her diagnosis from breast cancer from which she later died. She wrote, in becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality, and what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it might be, priorities and omissions became strongly etched in a merciless light, and what I most regretted were my silences. Of what had I ever been afraid? To question or to speak as I believed could have meant pain or death, but we all hurt in so many different ways and pain will either change or end. Death, on the other hand, is the final silence. And I began to recognize a source of power within myself that comes from the knowledge that while it is most desirable not to be afraid, learning to put fear into perspective gave me great strength. Likewise, it was the wisdom of Alice Trillin, the wife of Calvin Trillin, the writer for The New Yorker, who after a prognosis of 10% uh, survival from lung cancer, wrote in a letter to a younger woman, wrote a letter to a younger woman who had just survived a brutal rape. And Calvin Trillin retells this story of his wife and makes a point of saying she was not a religious believer. Uh, she wrote, no one would ever choose to have cancer or to be raped, but you don't get to choose, and it's possible at least to understand what Ernst Becker meant when he said something like, to live fully is to live with an awareness of the rumble of terror that underlies everything. 
it's also possible to begin to understand the line in King Lear, ripeness is all. You might have chosen to become ripe less dramatically or dangerously, but you can still savor the ripeness. She also wrote to a young child, you probably, many of you know that book, uh, five, I believe he was a five-year-old boy dying of cancer, Dear Bruno. And she, I won't try to convince you that there, ever, that there will ever be anything about having cancer that you like. But someday, when you are better, we should talk about it. The one thing I know is that you and I will know some things that other people won't know. There is no systematic explanation for the dark wisdom that can be born from a share in what we Christians call an experience of the cross. But witnesses, both living and dead, give evidence of its possibility. No explanatory language is adequate to express this mystery. Evil has no explanation because it is utterly without meaning. But these voices of wisdom, both those from explicit Christian witnesses and martyrs and those whose faith is known to God alone have no explanation because they participate in the inexplicable mystery of God's own wisdom, the wisdom we Christians believe is the power of God's spirit. This is not to be found in the negativity of the suffering itself but rather in the defeat of its power by love, by courage. In their lives and in their bodies, these witnesses image the God who was poured out in love for creation, the God who pitched a tent among us, the God who laid down his life for his friends. Others image the crucified one by clinging to Abba in the darkness, forgiving the unforgivable, and remaining faithful to their mission and to those to whom they have been sent, even unto death. Each of us has our own cloud of witnesses who have borne sorrow with courage and responded to hatred with love or simply managed somehow to keep on keeping on in the hardest of times. These are the ones whose lives and deaths reveal to us the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, the one that the letter to the Colossians calls us to embrace, the mystery of love that even death and evil cannot quench. Thank you.